This guy walked in my office one day. He said, I'm John Tenner. I'm with the Canadian Wildlife Service. Uh, uh, we want to start a polar bear study. I hear you know how to work on bears. So off I went, and I worked and for many years with the Canadian Wildlife Service, developing all the study techniques and the management programs that we needed initially, and, uh, and got, got all that work done. Been to a lot of the Arctic. I've probably worked in more parts of the Arctic than just about anyone else on, on Earth. When I first started working there, I was about the only guy working in, in the high Arctic in, in wildlife area. None of the other biologists had extended things like caribou work or Arctic hare work or mustelid work or anything into the Arctic. So I was kind of all alone uh, in terms of Canadian Wildlife Service. We were trying to get from the weather station at Eureka back down to Resolute. The weather just wouldn't settle down. And we left it off and we got to Norwegian Bay and suddenly, like it tends to do, it sucked in. We were inside a ping pong ball. Half the time we didn't know what was up, what was down, the right or left. Never have figured out in the map where we were, neither did the pilot. But we came around this point and it was instant whiteout. I said, let's follow the coast. Anywhere, we are flying. Oh, it's a bit clear there, let's go there. And then, oh, clear over there. So we were sort of zigzagging, trying to get out of there. And I remember looking between my feet and I saw rocks racing under my feet and I yelled at Gene, pull them up! What happened? I said, well, we hit the ground. <laughs> so he was all flustered and I don't know, he was trying to get control and we hit the ground again. And we were sliding along, it would have been okay, but we hit a little drift and it rolled over. And that was the end of the helicopter. And suddenly it was dead silence. And uh, the chopper was lying on its left side. You had a pilot, then you had uh, myself in the middle, and then you had Chuck. I'm trying to get out and I couldn't get out. I couldn't figure out why. And he says, take your damn seatbelt off, you know. And <laughs> I hadn't taken my seatbelt off. I'm trying to lift the whole helicopter. And Gene's yelling, she's gonna blow, hurry up, she's gonna blow. And there's no aircraft much fly over that area to, to uh, track your signal. If you were calling Mayday, Mayday, you know, who's gonna hear you, you know, except, except the polar bears, there's no help. And the bubble was still, you know, was cracked, but it was intact, and none of us was hurt. And so we were way off course. Radio didn't work. The emergency locator did not work. The battery had, was gone dead, because in those days, people didn't pay much attention to that. So we pitched a tent, a small pop tent, and we took the seats of the helicopter and used that to sleep on. And we had a little bit spare food left. We were munching on that. Suddenly in the distance, but, 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 and Gene suddenly blurted, there's another chopper, another chopper. So we all run out of the tent, and we all were on our bare feet, and it was maybe 15, 20 below. Didn't matter, we didn't feel that. They were putting along with their radio turned off, drinking coffee, going real slow, feeling their way along in the weather. And they went right on by us and then they started turning. And so one pilot said to the other suddenly, said, holy mackerel, look at that. What are those Inuit doing there, all the way out here? Let's go have a look. And they came over and then I said, look at that, chopper lying upside down, chopper crashed. And so they landed beside us, took us in, and uh, flew us straight back to Resolute Bay, where we landed the next morning. And we got out of that big helicopter at Polar Shelf. And a guy that runs Polar Shelf said, what are you guys doing here in this helicopter? Where's your chopper? Because the radio had been, been broken. He didn't know, have any idea. Nobody had any idea in the world that we had crashed. And in that country, we could have been there for weeks and weeks before anybody, if ever anybody, would have found us. That was like divinity. You know, God had smiled upon us and 
you know, give another lease on life there and, and uh, rescued us. I sometimes wonder if, you know, if, uh, if I did really crack up one of those times and that everything that I'm talking about and seeing and doing now is, is, that, is that period just before you, before you die when everything flashes before your eyes. And for all I know, uh, so maybe a minute or so ago, we may have had a crash landing and, and you're just flashing by. <laughs> in, that, in that one minute for your dead oh. Years of waiting become centered north as you leave warm reservation to travel unknown trails, guided by knowing you are the center of the universe wherever you are. You try to walk with all beings, knowing you do your best to do what is right. Your feet are light as song, walking bear song, that urges you on, urges you on to country of your ancestors, the Cree and the Chippeway, and walking bear comes finally home. Was it ancient scratches on glacier polished granite that told you your ancestors were waiting? Was it high wind that geese ride north or those owls who sang the great snowy, those owls on tree at your door at Old Dixon Agency? You want to paint your face a color mixed with red granite and Hudson's Bay water as a sign that you take your place at council fire with bears to talk a relative to share a song. You remember teacher singing who walking bear was as you scratched your joy deep in smooth hard stone and walking bear comes finally home. Glenn Lamish, thank you. So Chuck's always been a grizzly bear to me. I was very glad to give the old polar bear a hug a few minutes ago. He can be very fast and very fierce, which is like a grizzly. And very fierce wit, too. But grizzly bears need lots of wild open spaces. They know how to use a large variety of different types of resources, and they capture people's hearts. I often thought grizzly bear just because of the facial features and, uh, um, you know, because he, often he would go into the office and kind of scratch his back like a bear, you know. He would uh, growl and uh, um, make noises like a bear and behave like a bear. So I think we all thought he was Mostly a bear. When he's telling us and showing us about how bears live and where they live, uh, on the ground, things he eats, things bears eat, uh, and I think his personality is very bear-like. Ah, oh, well, I'm two-legged bear. I don't see him as a bear. I see him as an old human elder, mm -hmm. still representing what humans understood 10,000 years ago. Oh, he's a polar bear. <laughs> because, well, he just told me that he wants to be reincarnated as a polar bear, and I think he's already halfway there at least. Chunk what once uh, uh, told me that uh, he was a, a polar bear and that uh, he uh, even had his denning place picked out. I've got my den picked out on North Twin Island already. You go to the east side of North Twin Island, walk to the east, northernmost, northeasternmost tip, a nice sandy beach, pure white sand, and a real thick green carpet of, of uh, tundra. I hang a left and go about 60 yards, and there's a high bank about 10 feet high with this beautiful den that goes back in there about four or five feet, all lined with 
tundra plants and flowers and such. And uh, that's my den. <laughs> You remember teacher singing who walking bear was as you scratch your joy deep in smooth hard stone and walking bear comes finally home. Churchill, and now it's time to go. Dream for a dreamer, this lovely land of smooth boulders that are watchful animals until you look directly. You should circle a dance of respect for delicate stone, native faces along bitter bay, like polar bears who walk with an ancient pace. Yet Denali, I see your delicate face as fresh as new polar tracks and drifted snow under window, and wonder where you are on road as you fall back to Montana. Time finally forever changed, your laughter a lovely, clear, quick surprise. I could sing to you of mother bear and sacred cub we see on Sunday, or how we pray a blessing on drugged mother and rag limp cub being flown away from bear jail, or how a bear flew on center roof, hunting smell of cooked caribou that Roland's wife brings for us. But now nothing seems real without your shy yet open smile your freezing hands resting in mine, or that last hell kiss launched from school bus, that fired an understanding that I am loved, and I love, knowing that love does move mountains, and my spirit rockets through soft polar sky, making our world light up like a billion bursting stars. <laughs>